Things have changed hugely. I mean, I started in magazines in 1999, um, started off as um, the intern and then kind of worked my way up sort of slowly. Um, it's changed hugely. Being j absolutely honest, the way it used to work working on a monthly magazine was we'd work very hard for two weeks and then get drunk for two weeks. And actually, in a weird way, I mean, that really is true. You know, we, on, on Empire, we would, we would work, get the issue done, and then spend two weeks watching movies, kind of drinking in the pub afterwards, talking about them. So I guess the biggest change is a lack of time, in so much as we were, we were always working to that cycle. So you would have time, and as fun though it was, that was where all the ideas came from. People, you know, mates in the pub, you would talk, and that's where the magazine ideas would come from. Since then, um, you know, the internet obviously has become this, this huge, all-encompassing thing. There's also what's, what's happened in our line of business is interesting, where a lot of other newspapers and magazines have really started focusing more on film. It's a very vibrant place to be. You know, you look at box office, Avengers just became the third biggest film of all time, Bond just did 100 million. It's clear that that's a thriving market as opposed to, say, music, which has kind of collapsed with the, with the advent of iTunes and stuff into the traditional music market. So a lot of newspapers, in particular the Sunday supplements, have really tried to kind of crash our party, which is interesting. So, you know, if you're a reader now, we're competing a lot more for their time because you could, if you're a Sunday Times reader, then you might get your, your movie fix in, in the culture section and so on. So we now produce a monthly magazine. We go to press in the middle of the month and it will take two weeks to get that printed on, on shelves. But within that two weeks, we then go straight into the iPad. We then do one version of the iPad which goes internationally and then we then do a bespoke version of the iPad for the US market um, where we change the reviews to be relevant in, in timescales to the US market. So we've, we've gone from making one magazine into three magazines, plus the internet, plus now we do live events. So it's huge and it's, and it's it's really exciting. There's never a dull moment, and the new technologies are amazing. You know, the iPad has enabled us to access markets we couldn't have touched before. America was always this holy grail for us, you know, and it's such a big, big country that literally it sounds obvious, but it just it's impossible to drive on trucks at a reasonable cost. Magazines all across America, and American magazines work on the exact opposite business model. So. In the UK, we sell 80% of everything we print on Empire, whereas in the States, you sell 20% and you pulp the other 80% because it's such a massive country. So the iPad, to borrow a back to the futurism, you know, where we're going, we don't need roads. The iPad has meant we can just go direct to people. So it's really fascinating, it's really amazing, really exhausting. Um, we're what, uh, April now, and we're working now. We've got our covers flat planned till June 2015. Obviously when Star, the Star Wars news was announced, that cover got put firmly in for May 2015. And so we, we know what we want to do, and now it's a case of trying to populate that and working further ahead. Obviously the people we speak to, the, the film stars, the directors, they've got less and less time as well. So trying to get time in their diaries early enough that you can get all that done and still produce a good product that doesn't look, I hope, that you know that it's lost a lot of its thinking time. But then for the big projects, um, such as JJ Abrams, we pitched, we went to his office and pitched him that in August last year. I would like to point out this time frame, half the office thought this wasn't a very good idea. I uh, didn't like some of JJ Abrams' films. I thought he was someone that we should um, follow in terms of, I, I really like his films a lot, they're quite sentimental and I like that about them, he's, to me he's the new Spielberg. So um, I went and pitched it in August at Bad Robot um, and said look we want to tell your story, uh, we want to do it around Star Trek Into Darkness um, and frankly I was proven right when this January he was announced as the new director of Star Wars. Right Thank you very much <laughs> uh, the Empire Office. So. Um, but it kind of showed that time scale. So we pitched it to him in August, and he said yes at that meeting. We then came came away and came up with a load of ideas that we submitted to him about two weeks later and said, okay, here's 50 ideas on stuff we want to do. What do you think? He liked some ideas, he didn't like some ideas, he added to some ideas, um, and the result was a sort of a wish list of stuff we needed to achieve, and we spent then six months pulling that off. I've been starstruck a million times, you know, um, notable ones would be Angelina Jolie when I interviewed her for Tomb Raider. 
on the set and it was this amazing, it was the 007 soundstage at Pinewood and it was the big tomb from the film. And so they kind of plumped me on some stairs and said, wait here for Angelina. So I felt like kind of Indiana Jones already, the kid in me was awakened and it was amazing. And then there was this sort of cooey and Angelina Jolie skipped over to me in the Lara Croft outfit, which just doesn't leave much of the imagination. And then curled up and put her head on my lap and we spent an hour cuddled up doing this interview, which is gibberish. If you ever read that interview back, it's just gibberish um, because I was just fairly distracted. I've met so many of my heroes um, and you get spoiled and it's amazing and it is all, it ruins holidays is what it does because you kind of get flown first class around the world and put up in fancy hotels. And then for your holiday, you go to sort of centre parks on a train and you're kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm not sure this is good. Um, it's amazing. I mean, it's such an amazing, that's what I would say to people is, please never think it's going to make you rich. But my word, what an opportunity. You know, if you, if you enjoy, if you have a real passion for what you do, I think it's just, it's an amazing career to get into. Um, and you can really have, you know, I've seen a lot of the world thanks to this job that I wouldn't have been able to afford to go and see on my own dollar. Um, and I've met people that I couldn't have dreamed of getting near to, and it's it's amazing. It's a real treat. I mean, in terms of Todd films, interesting. I mean, I, I so I went from Empire to Zoo um, to a Total Film, and then back to Empire again. So I've got a big soft spot for Todd film. I edited it for about eighteen months. Um, what's interesting about it is, I mean, really, there are only competition on the UK newsstand. But really our focus is more on Entertainment Weekly in America than it is on Total Film and that's because um, they're our kind of big competitor. We, we try and position ourselves as a global brand so it's us, you know, touch, touch wood, Total Film are great and they will always sometimes screw us up on something or other but most times I'm quite confident saying we will, we will win that fight. The fight that's more interesting is the one with Entertainment Weekly who sell one and a half million copies a week in America. But our pitch is kind of, well, look, for Star Trek, you can do the American market with Entertainment Weekly or you come with us and we'll give you Russia, Portugal, Italy, Australia, US, UK. So that's kind of the more interesting battle at the moment. It's, it's a genuinely exciting place to be because I think, you know, these, it's, times are so tough for magazines. Everybody knows that's yeah. no secret. Newspapers, you know, times are very tough. But there's something about where we are that just feels really right. A lot of it, frankly, is, you know, people, people are always talking cliches, but a lot of them are kind of based in truth, that movies have always provided escapism. So they always say that in times of depression, you know, financial and emotional, people will resort to the movies. It's this great escapism. And actually, if you look historically, when, when the economy has collapsed, movies always do really, do really well. So the rest of the world is falling to pieces, but James Bond is doing 100 million pounds on the UK box office. So, and because we're playing in that area, it just feels like a really strong area to be in, and it's a really buoyant market that's kind of going up every year. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just really confident. I, I think you know, we are a rare thing if we're going up in the ABCs, which is what we're all measured on every six months. That's a big old drama. And you know, this company has, I think, 180 magazines, and it's, and, and we're doing really, really well. We've got the biggest subscriber base of any of those 180 magazines. So we've got 60,000 subscribers, um, which means, just as a little dig, we've got more subscribers than Total Film Cell on the newsstand. <coughs> um, so it's a, it's a great place to be. Uh, and I think, you know, really genuinely, the sky's the limit. I think we, we could go bigger and bigger. We got like we went to Skywalker Ranch, which is probably my greatest. Where for thirty years of Star Wars, Lucas said, "Okay, come over to the ranch and have a look in the archives, go through all the pictures because we wanted a lot of unseen pictures." And you turn out there, and it's just the most surreal place where they refuse. Yeah, huh? Honestly, it's just it's, you walk in and it's like, and they go, and there on your right is Lake Ewok, and you're going, "No, nah, really?" And and there's Lucas Arts, and there's all this kind of stuff. He's got his own vineyard. I've got still at home, pride of place, a bottle of Skywalker what ranch wine and stuff. But the best thing about it, they said, and then we went in the archive, which is just mental. As a as a geek, it's insane. But just as a film fan, you know, you walk in, the Ark of the Covenant is there. R2D2 and C3PO are over there. Han in Carbonite is there. 
And but the creme de la creme was we came out of it, and when George Lucas he basically built Skywalker Ranch with the money he made from Empire Strikes Back. So he negotiated this massive back end deal and became a billionaire off overnight. So he built Skywalker Ranch and he got all the planning commission done and San Francisco City Council or whatever wouldn't let him build it because it was so removed that it wasn't close to a fire engine, so the fire station. So they were saying, if, it, if a fire starts, no one can put it out. So George Lucas being George Lucas went, well, I'll build a fire station then. So he built his own fire station on Skywalker Ranch. And we literally went to see them, and it's the, that is the best job ever in the world, is to be a fireman at Skywalker Crunch. They do nothing. There hasn't been a fire in 30 years at Skywalker Crunch, and there's four of them, and they sit there and just play pool and watch telly, and they've got two fire engines, and we went and we were just chatting to them, and they said, would well, you want to drive the fire engine? I'm like, yeah. So we got dressed up in the, and it's all branded Skywalker Ranch, fire, you know, fire hats, all that. And I got to drive the Skywalker Crunch fire engine round Skywalker Crunch tooting the horn and all this kind of stuff. That was when you kind of go, yeah, you know. This is fine. This, this, is, is, why you, this is why you do it. So yeah, no, amazing, amazing, amazing.